first really cold day of the season today. Right now it's uh, 9.33 a.m. my time here and it's in the teens out there right now and um, it's pretty cold so please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along. I expect you to. Okay. I'm going to be going over a few things as concerning ministry and also concerning those who have been called in a position to preach, to teach, to exhort, that kind of thing. We're going to be addressing that because you know what? There's a lot of people out there right now who are calling themselves preachers or watchmen or even worse, <laughs> watch women. <laughs> watch woman from the scriptures, please. And also Watchmen only appears in the Old Testament, not the New. Why is that? Well, because uh, under the law, under the dispensation of the law, um, before, you know, before today, uh, this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, uh, the Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, um, was not a permanent residence in anybody. It could come and go, come and go, come and go. Today, anyone who is genuinely saved, born again, converted of the Church of the Living God, you have God living within you, the seal until the day of redemption, that circumcision made without hands, okay? That's the difference. But there's a lot of people, I mean, there's this, there's this one woman named Watch Woman. I forget what her, some kind of number. Watch Woman 66, probably, I, I don't know. Uh, a Hamite woman who uh, preaches Easy believism. Wow. Wow. But anyway, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 10 on to verse 18. Follow me along. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 10 on to verse 18. For the land is full of adulterers. Burp. <laughs> For because of swearing the land mourneth, the pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up, and their course is evil, and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest, prophet, excuse me, for both prophet and priest are profane. And there are no priests today. There is the priesthood of the believer, meaning that we can go to God the Father individually because, remember, our Lord Jesus Christ is God the Father, so we go to God personally, individually, unlike where in the Old Testament they needed a priest to go to. That's what the Catholics try to do. They tell you that you need them to, for them to go to God for you. No, no. The priesthood of the believer is that you and I personally, when the Lord saves you, you can go to God the Father directly. Jesus Christ. Okay? So let's continue. This is for instruction and righteousness. Obviously. Okay? Let's continue. For both the prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their ways shall be unto them as slippery ways in, dark, in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. For I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. Yeah, what kind of example are these people giving? These easy believism heretic devils here on YouTube and on other platforms. 
<laughs> just believe. You're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. What kind of example are these people giving? To go on offensives, to attack people relentlessly, like that's okay. Hmm. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, which is exactly what easy believism people do. Exactly what easy believism people do. You, you go to an easy believism heretic who's supposedly a teacher and want to talk to them. It's like, well, you know, to get counsel from them, you go up to them. It's like, well, I'm in sin. The first thing they say to you to make you uh, comfortable in sin uh, is to say, well, it doesn't affect your salvation. <laughs> they say that to pacify you so that you would have a, a light attitude towards sin. Okay. To keep you in sin, basically. Okay? They strengthen also the hand of evildoers. That none doth return from his wickedness. They are all they are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets. Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. Why is that? Because they receive not the love of the, of the truth. So God shall send them strong delusion. They are deceived. They are deceiving and being deceived. Someone who is convicted in an error, meaning that they believe what they're preaching and it's heresy, eh, those people are very hard to reach. Behold, I will feed them with wormwood and make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. And look at the uh, so-called prophets here in America today. I'd say about 98.9% .9 of them today are preaching easy believism. That other small percent are preaching lordship salvation. Where you got to stop sinning, then you go to the Lord and then he saves you. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that, prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart, and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Yeah, easy believism, this satanic love gospel, um, that's not of God. That is heresy. Okay, that is a gospel designed to ensnare you, keep you in sin, and um, ultimately to guide people on to taking the mark of the beast after the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, for those of you who get left behind, this gospel that is being spread today relentlessly is for that purpose, to have you people who are left behind to take the mark of the beast and damn you to hell. Okay. They say still unto them that despise me. The Lord has said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. These easy believism devils. I'm in sin. It doesn't affect your salvation. You, you shouldn't do that. But don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry, you're eternally secure, you're saved. Yeah, you, you probably shouldn't do that, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're going to heaven, you're saved, you just believe, right? Yeah, yeah, you just believe, so you're saved. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, again, yeah, you shouldn't do that, but don't, don't worry. Relax. You're saved, you're going to heaven. Go ahead, you can continue doing these things. You probably shouldn't do them, but that's okay. That's okay, because... You're eternally secure just because you believe. <laughs> Saying peace when there is no peace. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Okay? There is no peace. There is no peace for the wicked. Okay? For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Now, let's skip a little to verses 21 and 22. Now, 
if these easy believism devils were, if this truly was of the Lord, which it is not, but if it were, here's what they would be doing. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. They run. They want to be on the for they want to be in the forefront because they're working for Satan, their father, the devil. Okay? And they want to push this satanic doctrine of easy believism, the love gospel, lordship salvation, anything but the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which consists of, come on, you know this, brokenness, contrition, godly fear, fear of the Lord, and calling upon the name of the Lord. Okay? And that happens in one event. It's not a step one, two, three, four. No, it's not like that. When you come to the Lord broken of your self-righteousness, you're going to have godly sorrow because it's your fault that he died. And you're going to be afraid of the Lord because he's going to throw you in hell unless he forgive you. And unless you come to him on his terms. And in that fear, you're going to call upon the name of the Lord and may he save you. Okay? Okay? But see, these false prophets, they run. They want to be in the forefront. And they are pretty much in the forefront today. Absolutely. Verse 22. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then, should, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. I, have unfortunately, have seen a few of these easy believism devils lately. Um, there's no admonition to turn away from sin. There's none of that. It's none. Of, there's none of that. Uh, everybody's favorite YouTube Jesuit uh, recently uh, has been doing these things on uh, eternal security and whatnot, but yet not admonishing people for self-examination or to turn from sin. Why is that? Why is that? Because, see, easy believism heretics want to make you comfortable with sin by drilling into your head you're saved just because you believe. Okay? See, they skip over brokenness and contrition, and they go right to belief, and they, 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 they're against calling on the name of the Lord. Why? Because they are too good in themselves. They're proud. They're arrogant. They're stuck up in themselves because they save themselves by their belief. See? And they want to make you comfortable with sin. So you would have a light attitude on sin. I don't see any of them. The guy from New York, Mr. Smiley from Canada, okay? I, I don't see any of them. And Smiley, I, I know you haven't been busy lately. But December is coming and you will be. <laughs> Sick devil. But nonetheless, these easy believism devils, that there's no admonition to turn from sin. There's no admonition to examine yourself. None. None whatsoever. Just believe, just believe. You said, don't worry, it doesn't affect your salvation. When someone of the Church of the Living God, though, it's like, okay, yeah, your eternal life is secure, but uh, you're in sin. Uh, uh, hello, McFly, is this thing on? Okay, hello. <laughs> All right, you, you need to repent because, number one, the Lord lives in you, okay? If you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, uh, the Lord is in you, and the way you live reflects him. So if you're living in sin, you're, you're making our Lord look bad who lives within you, okay? And you need to examine yourself every day within the scriptures to see if your life is adhering to, to the scriptures. Okay? You need to repent. Okay? You need to get these the sin out of your life. And then right away they say, what? Well, you're saying uh, sinless perfection. It's just shut up. No. We cannot be sinlessly perfect today. But you, you got you to gotta try <laughs> to avoid sin in your life, even though you're not going to. Even though you're going to sin no matter what. You still need to flee from it. But while the easy believism heretic, it's like, whatever. While those of the church of the living God, uh, you're in sin, you, you need to repent like right now. Because if you're saved, if the Lord lives within you, if that circumcision made without hands is in you, um, the way you serve him reflects him. 
you're going to be disobedient, you got to be careful because he might just kill you and take you home quickly. And you might be saying, well, that's good. It's like, well, if he has to kill you, he's, he's going to be ashamed of you. You want the Lord to be ashamed of you? And if you don't say that doesn't really bother you, at least I'm getting in, I would really question whether or not you are truly saved. I would. So well, I don't let him be ashamed of me for all eternity. At least I'm getting in. See, that's self. That's self. See, we of the Church of the Living God are called to what? Charity, which is self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. He must increase. We must decrease. Okay? And see, if you've got a mentality of, well, I don't care if I'm how I get in so long as I get in. Um, I don't care how I get in so long as I get in. Even if the Lord is going to be ashamed of me for all eternity. No, 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 no. That, that's the wrong mindset. There, there's something not right there with you, dear friend, if that is the case, if that is your mindset, if that is your mentality, there's something very wrong there. I, I would recommend to you, get into the scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, and spend some time there with the Lord and see whether or not that salvation that he has offered you, whether or not it has taken. Okay? Now, go to Jeremiah chapter... Six. Let's let's refresh a little here. Verses twenty one and twenty two. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. And. How many of these easy believism heretics, how many of them actually speak anything from the scriptures? Very few of them do. Very few of them do. And there are some that do, that do attempt, um, <laughs> lacking tremendously and always taking things out of context. I've, always, I've noticed that. It's like, oh boy, man. But, go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 16 on to verse 19. Here's what the Lord says. Uh, and this, you know, you got these Christians today talking about we got to do new things, right? Thus saith the Lord, stand, uh, Jeremiah 6, verses 16 on to verse 19. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And see, right away, people will, when they think of the old paths, what do you think of? Think of the old people like what? Jack Hiles? Hmm? Beat Rockman? Mm. Oh, what about the Calvinistic Puritans who killed people who disagreed with them, who killed people who didn't believe in the Satanic Trinity? You want, you want to know what the old paths are? The authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? You want the old paths? Here's the old paths. Here's the right way. Okay? You search the Pauline epistles, which is doctrine for us today, and you, sir, you form your life around what is written, not what is written around you. Ah, yes. Let's continue. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Remember, watchmen is something of the Old Testament. Because remember, in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, was not a permanent resident in anybody, people. He could come and go, come and go as whatever. You sin, he disappeared from you. Okay? There is ample proof of that within the scriptures. Okay? Okay? This nonsense uh, 
Faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation is a nonsensical lie. Eternal security in every dispensation? That's insane. That's heresy. Okay? And as far <laughs> as far as faith alone in every dispensation in Scripture, just read the first three chapters of Genesis. But see, see the easy believism heretic, the lordship salvationist, and the ecumenical love gospel satanist, they're banking on one thing man's ignorance of the word of God. And there is a famine in the land that will reach its uh, fulfillment during the time of Jacob's trouble. But there is a famine in the land because how many Bibles are there out there? Lots of them. And they all contradict and they all subtract. This is the old way. This is the good way. Walk therein. Verse 18, Therefore hear, ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them? Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. Why? Because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. But rejected it. Yeah. Yeah. See, so many people, because you're all too busy, 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 got to keep going, got to keep going, right? Uh, you don't got enough time to spend 20 minutes in the scriptures. You don't got enough time to spend 10 minutes in prayer. I, I love you. That's nothing. 10 minutes in prayer, that's nothing. But hey, hey, if you can spend at least 10 minutes in prayer, good. That, that's a good start. That's a good start. Personally, I think everybody should spend at least an hour in prayer. But that, hey, 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 you know, 10 minutes, that's, that's a good start. 20 minutes, whatever, in Scripture, you know, it's not the time. It's the quality of the time and the quality of being led into the Scriptures by the Holy Ghost, who will guide you into all truth and the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. The Lord is that Spirit, okay? Um, that usually takes a lot longer than 20 minutes. Usually. Usually. Okay? That there ain't no excuse for you being lax and you reading scripture. Again, people have come to me and there are people who will not come to me or uh, talk to me about this because you know where I stand on this. Be like, I I'll, I'll, I'll tear your hide off. You know, like I've told you, I've known people who have children, wives on a farm who deals with cows and horses get up before the sun is out and spend 45 minutes a day in the scripture and yet take care of the kids and his wife and he's and you're going to say you don't have them that kind of time to spend in the lord and you're single and you don't have even a third of what that guy had give me a break okay give me a break see we as a church of the living god we need to center our lives around the word of god but so many, and these disgusting Christians, this is what they do. They want to have God circulate around the ease, the convenience of your life. Guess what? God, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, is not convenient. He's demanding. Oh, yeah, yeah. He doesn't save you just so you can go on living as the world. And he doesn't save you so you can wander aimlessly by your satanic feelings. Feelings because it's led by the flesh, the skin suit. Okay? you got to be aware of that, people. Now, go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse... Uh, am I looking at the right one? 2 Peter, beg your pardon, brethren. Sorry about that, yes. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 3. Beg your pardon. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 3. 
But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Just believe. God loves everybody. Everybody's going to be saved. You've got to stop sinning in order to be saved. Nonsense. Even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. To those false prophets who preach easy believism, the love gospel, lordship salvation, uh, and, bringing, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Your damnation is just. You're going to reap what you sow eternally big time. Big time. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And I've experienced that part of it right there by many emails, okay? Because, you know, you lost people. You get, a lot of you lost people. I know, okay, I know. A lot of you lost people. You seem to understand, at least about the um, easy believism, the thing about the God loves everybody. Also, a lot of you lost people that have contacted me also kind of figure that out because what's the, first, what's the first thing you say? How can a God who loves me send me to hell? <laughs> and so wait, I just got to believe and that will lead me to heaven. No changes, no nothing. It's like, no, no, just just simply walking around, do -do 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 -do, believe, right? It doesn't make sense. And also, what are you guys about the uh, Lordship Salvation? You're like, I, I can't stop this, and I'm supposed to stop it? Yeah, see, a lot of what the satanic heresy stuff that's coming out, especially this close to the catching way, the redemption of the purchase possession, uh, that's erroneously referred to as the pre-tribulation rapture, okay? But a lot of this is coming out actually doesn't make logical sense. And a lot of you, I know. Uh, I, I'm saying that because I, I got my cell phone here. Oh, beg your pardon, brethren, very quickly. Turn the rigger off just in case somebody calls me. Beg your pardon. Okay, but yeah, I, I, I get a lot of my stuff here uh, on email. Okay, I know this. Okay, a lot of you are like, that doesn't make any sense. You're right, it doesn't. Because it's not of God. And God is not the author of confusion. Let's continue. And right here, verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you so that they can glory in your flesh whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Make merchandise of you. That you fall for their lies, hook, line, and sinker, and then they can glorify in the fact that they've made you into a false convert. And it says here, and through covetousness. See, covetousness is the main guise. See, that's why repentance, being broken of your self-righteousness, is a must and is a requirement of, your, of salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ you got to be broken of yourself because, see, they use covetousness. The, I want my cake and eat it too. You can have the best of everything. Just believe. You see, you don't go through the door. You're a thief and a robber. You climb up another way. See. And the guys that they're working under is covetousness. You don't have to change. You don't have to uh, adhere your life to the scriptures and work your life around what God said. No, it's the other way around with these devils. You got you can work this around your life, not vice versa, see. And they do that through covetousness so that, see, you gain everything. Just believe, you gain everything. There's no loss. It's all about you. It's all about what you gain. You know, coming to the Lord costs you a lot. You got to lose your self-righteousness. You have to lose pride. Granted, pride really is still here in the skin suit, okay? 
Paul, the apostle, struggled with pride. That was his biggest sin, pride, okay? But see, you have to lower your pride in order for the Lord to save you. You have to realize that, you, you see, it's your fault. It's you. It's your fault. See, and that's what the easy believism uh, heretic, the love gospel uh, guy does. Uh, the Lordship Salvationist kind of touches on this. But there again, it's all about what you do. See? See, easy believism, the satanic ecumenical Catholic Jesuit love gospel, and uh, Lordship Salvation have three things in common. It's all about you. It's all about you and what you do. When true salvation is about our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. So see, they're using covetousness. Covetousness. And what is, ah, ah, now wait, hold on. Some of you are like, well, Paul said, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Don't worry. Very quickly, I mean, you can do a word search on covet, covetousness covetous and that kind of stuff. Um, we're not going to define it because we basically know what thou shalt not covet. We know what covet means. I want it. I want it. Give me, give me, give me. I want, I want, I want. I shall be like the most high. Give me, give me, give me. I, 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 me, me, me. That's covetous. That's being covetous. Okay. We basically know this. Okay. If you don't, well, you live in a well, you got your head in the sand. <laughs> well, you live in a cave. But we know what covetousness is. We know what it means to covet. Uh, go to Psalm ten. Just just one verse. What does what does the Lord think of covetous being covetous uh, and whatnot? Like you know that kind of stuff. What does he think about it? Okay. Psalm ten. Verse 5. Uh, let's read verses 4 and 5. A little context here. No, okay, beg your pardon. Let's read verses 1 on to verse 5. Started out with this one in the previous video, but this is meat. Let's start from verses 1 on to verse 5, okay? Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. The heart is evil and desperately wicked. But who can know it? The heart, your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But what am I quoting to you? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. Now, to abhor something means to have extreme hatred for that. Extreme. The, <laughs> the most hateful of the hateful, okay, is to abhor. And the Lord said, and it says here, that the Lord abhorreth the covetous. Mm. The wicked through the pride of his countenance. Remember, countenance is bodily. Visage is your face. So pride of his countenance, how you look, your stature, that kind of thing, uh, i.e. your flesh. The pride of flesh, the pride of life, okay? Will not seek after God. Why? God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. Hmm. But it says here in verse 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. 
See, the covetous that these devils are preaching unto you, are working off of, is to keep you in sin. That's why if you go to one of these devils, I'm in sin. Well, it doesn't affect your salvation. <laughs> See, they want to give you a light attitude on sin. To Fools make a mock at sin, okay, just so you know. And the fool says in his heart, there is no God, okay? Yeah, that's, that's the whole point. But see, now there are those of you who are saying, well, Paul said, Paul said to covet earnestly the best gifts, right? We'll look at that. But go there. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But see, Paul said, God, okay, we just saw proof. God abhorreth the covetous. God hates people. Yes. God hates people who are covetous. But what, what, but wait a minute. Didn't Paul say, didn't Paul, let's look at what Paul said. My fingers will work. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Verse, ah, let's read from verses 27 on to verse 31 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this is concerning the church and living God, the body of Christ, for those whom are saved, born again, converted, new creatures in Christ Jesus. Okay, this is for those who are saved. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has, hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues, language, languages. Okay, read Acts chapter 2, you wicked Pentecostal charismatic okay tongues are languages and you look in Acts chapter 2 they're known languages you're blah, 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 blah. that is of the devil that is not of God that is not of our Lord Jesus Christ our Father the Holy Ghost okay read Acts you know you say <laughs> Acts 238 Acts 238 <laughs> okay um you need to read the languages in Acts chapter 2, those were known languages. Tongues are known languages, okay? But, verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healings, healing? Do all speak with tongues, languages? Do all interpret? But covet! Earnestly, the best gifts. There it is. Paul said to covet the best gifts. Yeah, and yet shew I unto you a more excellent way. Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but let's read the very first verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity there is a big difference between love and charity you can love all the wrong things you can love your sin charity though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol now you go ahead and read i'm sure you have uh first corinthians chapter 13 in its entirety charity dear friend is self sacrifice see a lot of the, the the bibles i think all of them actually take charity out and replace charity with love love is love right so if love is love that means someone could be a, a christian sodomite right because love is love see, no no it's charity which is self-sacrifice. So, okay, look at verse 31 in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Don't look at me. Look at the scripture. 
but covet. God abhors coveting. Ah, wait. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet shew I unto you a more excellent way. And then it, talk, it goes into talking about charity, which is self-sacrifice. See, easy believism, the love gospel, lordship salvation, they work off of covetousness, what you do for your own self. It's all about you. I will be like the Most High. It is satanic because it has you as the center, you as everything. It's what you do. You stop sinning, then go to the Lord, then he may, may save you. You save yourself by just believing, okay? God's going to save you because God loves you, even if you hate him and don't want anything to do with him or live according to his word. See, easy believism, the love gospel, lordship salvation, all center around you. You are, the whole world revolves around you. Hmm, that's a really telltale tactic of devils. They see something and they think it's talking about them when it had nothing to do with them. But they, they you know, they, they go ahead and shoot themselves in the foot and expose themselves naked for what they really are because of it. <laughs> oh, I, I, I really feel sorry for you. I really do. Okay? But charity, self-sacrifice. So God said he abhors covetousness. Those who are covetous. But Paul tells us here to covet. And then he talks about charity, self-sacrifice. Hmm. 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 Go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Now see, while where these... Easy believism devils, the Lord, uh, the the um, love gospel guys, not so much the Lordship salvationists because they they go more in the area of sinless perfection, okay. But the easy believism guys and the love gospel guys, Ephesians chapter five verses three under verse five. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint. And see, easy believism. You save yourself by what you do, your belief. It's based off of covetous. The love gospel is based off of covetous. God's love is unconditional. God, does, uh, God has no condition for his love for you. There's no condition for him saving you. It's based off of you. And Paul says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, but he just said, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now pay attention. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God? Kingdom of God, the reference there is the spiritual aspect, not the actual kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, I should say, that is in Jerusalem. Because remember, kingdom of heaven, whenever you see that, always talks about, denotes the actual physical, literal kingdom in Jerusalem. Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God can mean the kingdom of heaven or the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God. In this context, it is the kingdom of God, the spiritual, okay? But, a covetous man who is an idolater. What is the idol you're worshiping? Look in the mirror, Jack. That's your idol. You, yourself. Which is exactly what easy believism, the love gospel, and lordship, salvation take off from. Love you. Uh, like, like Joker Butch Meyer once said, Hug yourself and love yourself. <laughs> you know, with much wisdom comes much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more you read this book, the more you realize that you ain't going to ever live up. That's why you thank him for his grace. That doesn't mean that you don't try to 
you know, try to abstain from all appearance of evil. But you realize the longer you walk with the Lord, it's like, I'm not going to live up to this. I just have to, you know, like Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Okay? I thank the Lord. I thank the Lord. Okay? But it says again, a covetous man who is an idolater. But Paul told us to covet. Why? Go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 on to verse 16. Land of extremes around here. It's either really cold or it's really warm. <laughs> so, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 on to verse 16. Now, when Paul said, covet, covet earnestly the best gifts, and we just saw that someone who is a covetous man yet is an idolater, because why? They are their own idol. But Paul told us to covet the best gifts. Why? For charity, self-sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 on to verse 16. But unto every one of us is grace give, is given, eh. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Mm. Charity is self-sacrifice. So the Lord would give you a gift to give unto others, not to glorify yourself, You ever talk to an easy believer, some devil? I'm not saved by works. <laughs> You're saved by your belief. Uh, yeah, you go to that, I'm not saved by works, when your sin is kicked. Justifying your sin. See, someone who seeks to justify sin will find any kind of loophole. Someone who hates sin and wants to be far from it will find every reason to hate themselves, to abhor themselves into repentant dust and ashes. Be careful for the, of those who seek first to justify themselves rather than justify God. Okay? But we see here, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You mean... If you're in ministry, it's not all about you. Really? <laughs> you know, you're out there doing something for the Lord. You, you mean it's not all about you, how you look? Really? Really? Yeah. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, <laughs> children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men, slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Where they lie in wait to deceive. Being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Got no roots in yourself, boy. Never did. Fortunate. Now, there's a difference between someone who gets corrected 
by our Lord Jesus Christ through the Church of the Living God, through the Scriptures, and, you know, that, that's totally different. When the Lord's like, hey, for example, I used, to, I used to believe and preach and teach that you could tell if someone was of the Church of the Living God if they could merely say, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. I used to believe that. I used to preach that. I used to teach that. Blue, whoa, I was wrong on that. The Lord showed me, and I publicly repented of it. And there were some whose cover were blown because of it, and they went on woo -hoo -hoo, all crazy, okay? I used to teach that. That's wrong. That's not true. Because devils can easily say, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And they can also say, Jesus is the Lord. Okay, they can say those things, yet they're lost devils. It does not show any proof that you're saved. I used to teach that. I used to believe that. I was wrong. And I publicly repented of that. And then the videos are on this channel that you can see them. Okay, so you can see that, guess what? <laughs> I make mistakes. Okay. And I'm accountable to the Lord, but I'm also accountable to the Church of the Living God. Okay. That's different than someone who's wishy-washy, an unstable man, okay? Like a wave tossed to and fro. You know, one minute you believe in eternal security, the next minute you believe in lordship salvation. One minute you believe um, in easy believism, next minute you believe in the love gospel. You know, it's, it's, it's a mess. You know, that's, that's the difference, okay? Paul is talking about those who are unstable, who have no firm foundation. How can they? How could they? If they're, that we henceforth be no children. Now that also denotes being a babe. Yes, it does. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men, slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. So see, verse 14, children denoting babes, someone speaking the truth in love, may grow into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, the foundation, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Hmm. Hmm. So, it's not about you. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and edifying the church, his body, the church of the living God. So, the Lord saves you. It's not just about, it's not about you. You are his ambassador, see. Okay? You are his ambassador. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's not about you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Excuse me. Excuse me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's not about you. See, the Lord saves you. It's about charity. What the Lord gives you, you are to give on to others. You are to share what the Lord has given you. Whatever that may be, okay? A spiritual gift, uh, teaching, preaching, laying out tracks, singing uh, hymns, whatever it is, we are to share, not hoard it for ourselves, see? But see, there again, like I said, easy believism, the love gospel, Lordship salvation has what at its center? Covetousness. You. Well, the gospel, the church of the living God has who as their center, as their head? Jesus Christ, God our Father, our Lord. But as we all know, what's going on out there? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 9. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Remember, covetousness, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, 
unholy, unholy. Not different, not separate from that. Uh, verse 2 is a very good definition of easy believism heretics. Without natural affection. <laughs> Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Everybody's favorite YouTube Jesuit. I saw him in a video, unfortunately. I can't watch him. But, you know, trying to be, trying to pretend to care about people. It's so... It, it's so disgusting. It's so obviously fake. You know, yeah, you really care about people. Uh -huh. Yeah, you only care about people to make yourself look good. You don't care about them because you're concerned where they're going to go. And you want to see them grow. No, 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 no. You just want to glory in their flesh that you're taking them to hell with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> These easy believers and people. They're, they're, they're absolutely disgusting. They're, when they try to shoot true natural affection onto those who they're purporting to care for. <laughs> wow, with brethren like that, who needs enemies, right? <laughs> Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, Despisers that uh, despisers of those that are good. Oh, they hate the church of the living God. They hate us. Especially when you talk about repentance, brokenness, you know, contrition, fear of the Lord. Especially calling on the name of the Lord. See, calling on the name of the Lord thing. They are in them they're they're proud. I saved myself by what I did, my belief. They're too proud of themselves. They're too good to call upon the name of the Lord. Hence, they call that heresy. They say it's a work. Like uh, abstaining from all appearance for, uh, of evil. That's a work. It's your reasonable service. It's what you're supposed to do. And not make justifications for it. By saying, I, oh, I'm not saved by works. See, that's someone that a, that's something a lost person says. You know? Don't judge me. <laughs> oh, trying to justify your sin, huh? Traitors! Heady, high-minded! Right there. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Having a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. A form of. A form of being separate. But yet just like the world because they deny the power thereof. Why is that? Because... They want you to be in sin. They want you, people. They want you to be comfortable with sin. See, God doesn't want you comfortable with sin. God wants you to abstain from all appearance of evil. To abstain from sin. To flee it. We're going to sin. We can't get away from that. But see, we have to live our lives according to the scriptures to get away from sin. Okay? Okay? We're going to sin. Sinless perfection is impossible. Why? Because our spirit and soul are housed in the skin suit. Okay? It's impossible for us to not sin. Okay? There are those guys out there. Well, you have a written. Oh, shut up. Just go take a long walk off of a short pier. Okay? Again, sinless perfectionists like the Lordship Salvation guys. You know, they, they pretty much... Pretty much are about law, uh, sinless perfection. Pretty much. <laughs> it's pride. It's covetous. I don't sin anymore. Yeah, and you're ugly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's continue. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers lusts. Going after the woman, just like Satan did in the Garden of Eden. 
ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning. Always learning. But the truth, the truth, skip out on. Now as Janais and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. As theirs also was. Like I said, like I keep telling you, sooner or later, sooner or later, guess what? They're all going to shoot themselves in the foot. You watch. They do all the time. They do all the time. Now go to First Timothy, uh, Second Timothy, chapter four, verses one on to verse four. Again, more on this covetousness thing. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, alive and the dead, at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Be prepared. Once in my life, once, once, I came up, I was, a situation came about of the Lord and I was not prepared. Why? Because I didn't have my scriptures on me. I leave my house, I'm always armed with a sword. I go to get the mail, I have my scriptures on me. I go to walk my dog, I have the scriptures on me. I go to the garage, I have the scriptures on me. To, to do the laundry, I have the scriptures on me. To take out the trash, you get the point. Once in my life, once, a situation arose and I didn't have the scriptures. And it was a fiasco. And from that day, I swore that will not happen again, as far as if, if I can help it, if there's anything I can do. So, you know, whenever I leave the house, I always have the scriptures on me. You listen to me. I've told you on many occasions, take the scriptures with you. Well, I only got one cassette. So what? Take it with you. Well, it's a pretty... Quit making excuses. Okay? If you need a compact version, you can find them. You can still find them. Compact versions, you know, like little small ones, you can get them. Even this that was given to me by a beloved brother... Um, this, I mean, this is still, this is a good size, but it's still compact enough that I would, I, I've got certain ones that I take with me, but because <laughs> this one was, well, never mind. But I mean, the point is, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. How are you going to do that if you don't have the scriptures on you? I don't have pockets. Shut up. Get a get a uh, hip purse. Okay. Doesn't matter. My challenge to every single one of you of the Church of the Living God, every single one of you. You know that old saying? I'd rather. Uh, uh, why are you taking a weapon with you? Why well, I'd rather have it and not need it then need it and not have it. That shame I had that day because I couldn't answer someone's questions according to the scriptures because I didn't have them on me. I've never forgotten that. That's, that's an exquisite shame. Okay? Granted, I was still... 
pretty much a babe at the time, yes. But the point is, especially if you're a babe and you're out there doing whatever and the Lord's like, get going. I, I'm going to, come on, let's do this. It's like, okay, Lord, I got the scriptures, you know. My challenge to all of you of the Church of the Living God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, carry a sword. Always carry a sword. You ain't got no excuse. You can't get one? Get one. Okay? When time is able, if I'm able, um, get a hold of me. I can get you one, a little compact one. Okay? If I'm able. Okay, right now I'm not able. But you know what I mean? Always take the scriptures with you. Because we're commanded to what? Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. How are you going to do that without the scriptures? You say you can do it from memory? I wouldn't trust that. Even if you've memorized this, that, and the other thing. People, brethren, we're at war. Carry a sword. Verse 3. For the time will come, time has come, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. Itching ears. Itching ears. See, the Christians in the buildings, the people put people up there that come from the Jesuits, you know, Jesuit uh, cemetery schools. Every single one of them is a Jesuit cemetery school, even Moody. Okay, that was part of the Jesuits' plan to infiltrate everything. And, you know, you go to these cemetery schools. Uh, they come out with, Yea hath God said, do uh, doctrine, okay? The, the Greek says this or something. They, they basically become a Jesuit James White. Oh. Or if they go to, like, a PBI or something, they come out like Rockman. Uh -huh. Huh. Yeah. But, see, they put people who won't offend them. They put in these church buildings, these Christians, they set up people who do not offend them. These easy believism heretics, they don't offend their own. Why? Because they have no standard for sin. The only thing that they offend are those of the Church of the Living God who talk about uh, separation, holiness, meaning being other than that. And see, guys like Comfort, like Washer, they equate holiness with sinless perfection. No, we can't be sinlessly perfect. Holiness means being other than that. Other than, okay? Godly, separation, okay? God is other. All right? But Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Verses 8 on to verse 12. Old Testament. This is not a new thing where they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They put people in place that don't offend them. Who tell them things that they want to hear. Not things that they need to hear, you know, like going, uh, leading them back to the old past. Okay? Isaiah 30, verses 8 on to verse 12. No? Yes. Uh, let's go to verse 13. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, itching ears, 
Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Smooth things. God loves you. God's not mad at you. God loves everybody. You believe that Jesus died, uh, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures? Why, sh sure. Okay, you're saved. That's it. That's it. God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not going to judge you. You believe, right? Yeah, you're saved. That's it. I mean, that, no, no, just, hey, you believe, just believe. You're saved. I don't feel any different. I, that, you know, that, what, what, that, how, how come I still want that? I don't worry about it. You're saved. Smooth things. Prophesied seats. God has a plan for your life. And he does. A plan of self-sacrifice, not self-fulfillment. See, you hear these Christians go back to, God has a plan for you in my life. That's said in covetousness. You arrogant, pompous ass. Okay? Yes, that's said in covetousness. Remember, an ass is a donkey. Okay? It said in covetousness, in pride, God has a plan for my life. Not in, uh, in charity, self-sacrifice. Okay? Which say, to the seer, see, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Giving themselves over to fables. Don't tell us what the Word of God truly says. No, 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 no. No. Give us a Bible that has man's words in it. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because he despised this word and trusts in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. Therefore, this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. Also, Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 25 on to verse 31. 25, uh, 25 on to verse 31. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that set a snares. They set a trap. They catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. Hmm. Hmm. They are waxen fat. They shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless, yet they prosper. And the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. Hey, and what will ye do in the end thereof? And Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. Verses 30 on to verse 33. Hmm. How many times have have you warned someone of the truth and they give you lip service? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, that's true. 
but yet they keep going for that cliff. Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they shew much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear thy words, but they do them not. <laughs> One who uh, came to me talking about how he's still so, uh, still in the sin of pornography. Warn him. And yet, you still don't, there's still no abstaining from that sin. There's no getting away from that sin. Why? Why is that? <laughs> uh, why is that? For with their mouth they shew much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Verse 33. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. Why do these people, why do these Christians why do they want these people who are false, these people who itch their ears for covetousness? Yes, but why? Why? What is it? What is the one thing they want to avoid the, more, the most? Micah chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 6. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it, because it is in the power of their hands. That's right. Remember, God isn't holding a gun to your head. Neither is the devil. All things are uh, all things are there for you to do, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful unto you, but all things edify not. And they covet fields and take them by violence, and houses, and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, and even a man and his heritage. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil, from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily, for this time is evil. This time is evil. And how many of these so-called preachers are so haughty, so haughty. In that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the, por the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. Why? They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. You don't want to hear about a vengeful, angry God who's going to judge you according to your, according to your ways at the great white throne of judgment, do you? No, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear about a God who loves you and has no conditions for your life, who's okay with you in sin, because remember, you're eternally secure, you're saved. It's not going to cost you your salvation. That's not God. That's the son of perdition. That's satanic. And if you have fallen for easy believism, the love gospel, the lordship salvation, you have fallen into one of Satan's many traps. Okay? Now, go to 2 Corinthians. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, these guys base everything that they do off of covetousness to puff you up, to give you a light attitude on sin, to puff you up. Not to build you up, not to grow you. They bank on covetousness because it's all about what you do, remember? First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 on to verse 12. Here is the motivation of those who are truly saved. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance, and not in heart. They glory in appearance, because their heart goeth after their covetousness. And we, knowing the terror of the Lord, we go out to what? To persuade men. Why is that? Why is that? Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ. 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 3. See, our motivation is to fear the Lord. Our motivation is we don't want to see you go to hell. Our motivation is to see you grow in the knowledge of Christ in the scriptures, abstaining from all appearance from evil. That is what we, the church of the living God, truly want. It's self-sacrifice. See, it's not hoarding to ourselves. It's not about us. It's about the Lord. Okay? Well, these devils, it's all about you. Remember, the world revolves around them. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 on to verse 3. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. taking the oversight thereof. You mean it costs you to preach the gospel? Yes. Yes, it does. You mean give out things for nothing unto those that they may grow thereby? Yes. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock, and samples, samples, examples. Not being lords over God's heritage. What does that mean? Let me show you. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Being lords over God's heritage. Diatrophies. We love it to have the preeminence. Okay, what is, what is this talking about? Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. If you have a set of scriptures that have red words, this is Jesus, God our Father, talking. Look what he says here. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And, and, and uh, verse 15, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What is a Nicolaitan? Verse 3 and 1 Peter chapter 5. 
neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. A Nicolaitan is someone like a Jesuit Catholic priest who lords over the flock. Okay? Those who are called to ministry, we are servants and we are here to serve, okay? Not expecting anything in return. Not using tactics, guilt tripping to get things from you. But suffereth all things that you may grow thereby. And you know what, brethren? This is my passion, not my profession. God forbid, become a professional preacher. Yeah. What's your example for being a professional preacher? Paul? Or someone who preached in church buildings all his life? Is that your example of a preacher? Is that who you uh, model yourself after? Hmm? Hmm. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. See, the Lord took everything away from me to establish me to do what I'm doing today. And through you, the Church of the Living God, our Lord has provided for myself and my wife for our needs not our greeds, okay? And praise the Lord for it. But see, this is my passion. I would do this the way it has done, even if, even if the Lord wasn't providing for us through this. And he is, he has, praise the Lord. But see, this is my passion, not my profession. This is what I do, but it's my passion. When you reach a point where you... F Luke chapter 12, verses 13 on to verse 21. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge, over, judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Stop. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. <laughs> My wife and I live in a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> Welcome to my ministry office. Okay. <laughs> and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods. Lay up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. I have arrived. So you know what? I'm just going to chill and Give little things here and there as I see fit. Because this is my job, man. So here. Here, okay, I guess I got to do this. Okay, so here. Give you this. Give you that. Give you this. Take it easy, man. I've arrived. I've, I've been there, done that. Yeah. I've been there, done that. Look at how I've been blessed. I have been, I am so blessed. I, oh, wow, this, we're, we're, we're running out of room. Let's, hey, let's, let's get some more stuff about where we can move and whatnot, right? But God said unto him, 
thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I praise the Lord that our Lord gives us just what we need. Our monthly expenses, not, not talking about food, gas, laundry, that kind of stuff, uh, clothing. This year we had to buy some new winter stuff because <laughs> some of it was really getting decrepit. But our monthly expenses every month is at, at the minimum $1,200. At the minimum, $1,200, 1200 a month, at the minimum. At the most because of electric, but we've been doing really good because of that. But at the most uh, because of the electric bill and the cold months and whatnot, at the most it's 1400 okay? And praise the Lord, the Lord has been providing that for us. And those of you, you know who you are, we love you and thank you. Uh, thank you for your prayers too. But our monthly expenses are that. And see, the Lord gives us just what we need. Why? Because if our Lord gave us more, I fear how we would spend it. See, because my wife and I, we, need, we want to be dependent on the Lord. We want to be. Because see, if we start to get any self-sufficiency, we lose it. How? Because we, that can lead to pride. That can lead to covetousness. My wife and I, we are not self-sufficient. We're not. We absolutely are not. Why? Because when you are self-sufficient, self-sufficient, hello? But when you are Christ-dependent, that changes everything. See, that's the thing. Easy believism, the love gospel, lordship salvation, it's self-sufficient, not Christ-dependent. If, if some of you were a little bit more Christ-dependent, uh, I think uh, it would make a whole big difference in your lives if you were Christ-dependent and not self-sufficient. Now go to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. One of these days, it's up to the Lord, I'm going to do an expository on this. Uh, I think I might have or anything or something, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Look, just because you're, you're called to ministry doesn't mean you can't eat and drink. Have we not power to lead about a sister? A sister? A wife? as well as other apostles and of the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, Peter. So you're in ministry. Uh, that what? I'm not supposed to have a wife, a sister? Hmm. Or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Oh, and a lot of these devils hate this one. Working in the secular but concentrating all that you do, that you would do for secular, for worldly things, you do as the Lord would have you to do. Yes. 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 Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? And see, mine wasn't by choice. 
<laughs> Mine was not my choice. Everything was taken away. And the Lord was like, you're going to do this because you have no more options. But today, there are no options. <laughs> Go to work and wear a face mask with a heart condition? <laughs> yeah. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk thereof? Milk of the flock, excuse me. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the, mock, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things, things pertaining to the flesh, needs? If others be partakers of this power over you, such as, you know, governors and that kind of stuff, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Paul chose not to use the power that he rightfully had being called to preach the gospel. He chose not to do it. But suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye now, in the same breath, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Like remember with the Levites, they were supposed to get certain things and eat of those things, like of the meat offerings and stuff like that. Okay. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of, not off, of the gospel. What does it mean, living of the gospel? Being Christ-dependent. Knowing that he shall provide all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Living of the gospel by adhering your life around the scriptures and being an example to the lost and unto the brethren by the way you live. Verse 15, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things that it should be so, be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. You have to remember something about Paul too. He was a single man, never married, never had kids. So it was only he himself. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have a child. Okay? Keep that in mind about the Apostle Paul. Plus, the Apostle Paul wasn't stationary. He was constantly moving, <laughs> moving around. Okay, he he was he was going into all the world. Okay, for though I preach the gospel, some people need to remember this. I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You ever been in a situation where you've had a burning in I'm speaking on to the Church of the Living God, obviously, where you have a burning in you and you can't explain it. And that burning is like you want to erupt unless the Lord, you know, unless you open your mouth and the Lord guides you in speaking. You ever been through that before? Have you ever been in a situation the Lord orchestrated and you know it and the Lord wants you to you know, tell, tell these people the gospel. What happens if you don't? 
Hi, what happens if you don't? You walk away shamed, guilty, feeling like you want to test the raft, rafters up there, whether or not they would hold your weight. It's quite a thing when you pass over a door that the Lord had purposely opened and wanted you to go through that door because he was going to use you. It's quite a thing when you neglect that because of whatever reason. It's quite a thing when that happens. That feeling, that shame, that guilt, that sorrow, I can't describe to you. And I don't want you to experience that because it's quite devastating. And I know for certain that it has been so devastating unto some that it has even crippled them to the point where they don't think they uh, want to do anything, that they don't want to do anything because of fear. See what a little disobedience gets you. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Without charge, meaning that Paul took care of his own needs because he was a single man and he wasn't a stationary person. Okay, He wasn't staying in one place for all that long of a time two, three years at the most at some occasions, but he was constantly moving, okay? Constantly on the move. When he has already said that there is power there for those who are in ministry to live of the gospel, to reap the carnal things when those, when they supply to you spiritual things. He's already established that. But you got to remember, Paul was single. He had not a wife. He had not a child. He was constantly moving. Okay, so when he says without charge that, you know, being taken care of rightfully, as we have just seen, rightfully, according as the Lord had ordained, but without charge, meaning because he, t he did his own thing because he chose not to take this power upon him, see, because he didn't have a wife, he didn't have a child or anything like that. So without charge, meaning it's like, hey, you know, that they were going to pay, give him money so he could eat, give him money so he can get clothes. See, that's what Paul meant. Not meaning I'm charging you in order to hear what is being preached. Oh, you want to know the rest of the part of that of the scripture thing? You got to pay me a little money in order so you can hear it. That's not what that's talking about. And woe to you who have that mentality. You want to hear the gospel? You want to hear deep things in scripture? You got to give me money for it. Woe be to you. Woe be to you. For though I be... Now, here's something else that I think some people need to remember. For though I be free from all men, Yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain this, the more. Made himself, what does that mean? That he gave himself over to the Lord's dictate to orchestrate the circumstances. Not that he purposely went there or there, but he's like, okay, Lord, whatever uh, circumstance you're going to open up for me, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm yours to use. Okay? And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without, Christ, uh, without law, to the weak, became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things, to all men, that I might by all means save some. It 
it seems that there are some people out there when they reach a certain point that they they there's no no relatableness that they're not willing to go to the homeless guy because of oh well they they just want money and yeah that's true or or oh they're Hamites I'm not gonna go speak to a Hamite because I'm of Japheth huh? see when you arrive when you get to a certain area almost a celebrity type status and not willing to condescend to men of low estate. Because, after all, you, you, you arrived. You know, you're, you're a big time preacher. Signing people's Bibles, like John MacArthur. Autographing people's Bibles. Ken Helvin. Charging, I remember that. Uh, why in the world is this happening? He was charging 500 bucks for that satanic blasphemous book of his with his autograph in it. And of course, we're talking about Kent Helvin, okay? <laughs> I'll speak to the bums. I'll speak to the homeless. I'll, I'll go to a basketball court uh, that have, uh, with only Hamites there, being the only Japheth, uh, of Japheth there amongst them. And he's like, hey, you guys want gospel uh, gospel tracts and stuff like that? And talk to them and preach the gospel to them. Okay? Why? I have made all things to all men. See, you resign yourself, uh, like in here, in verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all. Paul didn't make himself do this. What that means is, he's like, okay, Lord. Wherever you are going to send me, whatever circumstance you are going to orchestrate, I'm your guide to use. Use me. Okay? That's what that's talking about. And because Paul resigned himself onto the Lord's handling, oh, oh yeah, the Lord's handling. He, he went to the Jews. He was to, went to those under the law. He went to the weak. Okay? That doesn't mean that he became like them. Perfect example. You don't become a sodomite in order to preach to sodomites. Okay? No. No. He resigned himself. It's not about us. It's charity. It's self-sacrifice. But or is this just a job to you? Is this just a profession? You've been there, done that? Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. Be careful. Be careful. Can I ask, for the third time that I'm aware of, how approachable are you? Or are you so holy that no one can approach you unless they have an appointment? Yeah. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. That corruptible crown, the praises of men. Stop! Your name and lights. Autographing a book that you wrote or autographing uh, a Bible. I mean, give me a break. How vomitous. See, an incorruptible crown, spiritual fruit. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, beateth the air, shadow boxing. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. 
but I keep my body, but I keep under my body, mortify, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Meaning, meaning, Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, verses 17, on to verse 24. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, those who live as if there is no God. A teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge, knowledge, not wisdom, it says. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And of the truth of the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Hi. Thou that preachest a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? I keep under... My, I keep my under my body, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Abhorrest idols, sacrilege, covetous, idolater, idolizing yourself. Let's get right to it there, buddy. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Being a hypocrite. Now, unfortunately, because we are saved sinners of the church of the living God, we all have some hypocrisy in us. You have the church of the living God and you say you have zero hypocrisy in you? You lie, you lie, and your breath stinks. You lie. You might as well just say that you're sinlessly perfect. No. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. We all have some hypocrisy in us. See, that's, that's the result of having sin relegated to the skin suit. Our spirit and soul are housed within this. Hence, the spirit and the flesh. But see, Paul, that's what he was addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I keep under my body, lest I be a castaway. What would make him be a castaway if he weren't keeping under his body? Oh, being a hypocrite, saying and saying to them and yet doing the same thing that he was preaching against? Yeah, you, you don't you don't do that, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and if I, and you probably don't sin anymore, do you? Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Verses 7 on to verse 12. See, so you got to remember. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Nice tie, nice clothes. You look the part. Because you're, you're, the video quality is... Uh, mwah! Dude, let it look unprofessional. <laughs> I, 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 I touch a button the and he, he, here this, this is this is the the extent of my professional looking videos give me a break yeah let it be a little fuzzy okay do ye look on things after the outward appearance If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we all, all, all even so are we Christ's. 
And though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, to build up, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. See, and right there, we of the church the living God, who are called to ministry or whatever capacity it is that the Lord has called you to, our job is for edification first. Okay? To edify the church of the living God. The easy believism devils, the love gospel devils, the lordship salvation twits, what's there? What do they do? They start with destruction. <coughs> that I might that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Amen. 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 You mean Paul didn't look the part of how strong he preached? No, he said he was weak and contemptible. A little undersized man. That was the thing about apparently, and this we don't have in scripture. We do know about Paul what physically? That he was quite scarred, probably got, had a hunchback of some sort. I believe Paul had tremendous vision problems, okay? We also are, um, through non-scriptural sources, learn that Paul might have been pretty short. I don't know about that. But we do know that Paul bore in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. We also know, I believe through scripture, that Paul probably had, was probably almost blind. Paul wasn't much to look at. Kind of like our Lord Jesus Christ wasn't much to look at, according to Isaiah chapter 53. So when you got someone who is making a big to-do about their presentation, how they look, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, that's a red flag for me. That's a big red flag for me. Okay? Now, granted, you're not going to do, do a video or be out there in your birthday suit. Of course not. Of course not. You're going to dress appropriately according as the scriptures would have you to. Of course. But, you know, to draw attention to yourself. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Do you wish sometimes you were deaf and blind so you could judge things according to the scriptures without the defilement of having to see or hear something? I wonder how many marriages there would be that were truly blessed of our Lord if people went into them like that. Let such a one think this, that, such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. See, even though the physical appearance didn't match what they thought because of they were looking on the outward appearance, they walked their talk. Do you walk your talk? I do the best that I can every day to do so myself to walk what I tell you <laughs> lest I be a castaway. For we dare for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are what are not wise. What? Where do you get the idea of what a preacher is? By those of the past? Or by those of the past? See, 
see these Christians and the, and their hirelings in the buildings, man. They they got to go to a Jesuit uh, run university and get a piece of paper that says man says or excuse me, uh, the Jesuits say I am qualified to do this. And that's what a preacher is. You don't know God. You have no clue who God is. None. None whatsoever, sir. None whatsoever. Uh, now go to chapter 12. My One of my... <laughs> and see, charity. And see, when approached in charity as it ought to be, our Lord will reward that. But see, Paul had a problem. Pride. I have a problem. Pride. And like Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 on to verse 10. And every one of us of the church of the living God has in some way a thorn in the flesh. And lest I should be exalted above measure the, through the abundance of the revelations, because Paul's sin was pride, his biggest sin that he dealt with was pride, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. I got to say that I prayed to the Lord more than thrice that my heart condition would depart from me. My heart condition came to me by number one, defiling the temple of God by eating poorly. Two, Asking for it. And asking brethren to pray for it too. Especially a specific brother from Australia. Who um, who when that man prays. Um, <laughs> yeah. God answered his prayer. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now see, there, Paul was not boasting of his infirmities to people because we just, walk, we just saw his physical appearance, his bodily presence was weak. But see, that Paul wasn't using that as a way marker to hide behind, okay? That's just what he was. But see, knowing that his physical body, his physical appearance, his bodily appearance was weak and his speech was contemptible. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul embraced his weakness. He didn't hide behind it. He didn't boast about it either. He didn't. He just, this is, okay. I'm weak. I have a thorn in my flesh. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord. Here I am. What you see is what you get. How many though? They see the professional preacher. And then outside of that, there's something else. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Why? For when I am weak, then I am strong. What does that mean? That he wasn't self-sufficient. That he was Christ-dependent. I thank the Lord that I have to depend on him. I praise the Lord that I'm not self-sufficient. I praise the Lord that what he gives us through the church of the living God is just enough for our needs. Because why? I struggle with pride like Paul does. Like Paul did, excuse me. I struggle with it. And man, I don't want to ever, 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 ever 
feel self-sufficient. Christ-dependent, there's a big difference. And that comes with time. That comes with time. Not with youth, unfortunately. See, I have long prayed for that someone of the generation of today would arise to be a voice not to only to his generation, but be as Timothy, an example of someone who is a youth today. When I say youth, I'm referring to 20s. Okay, look, if you're in your 20s, you're a youth. Okay, <laughs> one guy I used to work for when I was a caretaker. There, there are some stereotypical things with 20 year olds, aren't there? Even with saved 20 year olds. Okay, and I know quite a few 20 year olds. But the one guy I used to work uh, for when I was a caretaker, he um, he had his wife's or his girlfriend's daughter living with them, who was a uh, 20-something-year-old. And he had on his refrigerator, it's like, you 20-year-olds, quick, move out, get a job, do everything on your own while you still know everything. And without exception... Without exception, the stereotypical thing of some of 20 year olds, there is still, even in saved 20 year olds, this, this is something about the youth. There is still that thing of when you're in your 20s, you think you know everything. I know in my 20s, I thought I knew everything. Unfortunately, that is a stereotypical thing. Luke chapter 3, verse 20. Don't, don't worry. We're going to be addressing Timothy, okay? Luke chapter 3, verse 23. When it comes to ministry, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And we'll stop there. 30 years old. God manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Began his public ministry when? In his 30s. Why not his 20s? Why not his 20s? Because in the 20s and your 20s, you still have that youthful, that's, you know, they talk about teens is a, kind of a transition from adolescence to grown-up hood or whatever. Uh, I, I consider the 20s in there myself. Um, I have met some very responsible, very adult-like 20-year-olds, you know, uh, but still, there's usually in 20... And look, if you're in your 20s, please do not get offended. This is just the way it is, okay? Jesus began his ministry in his 30s. And yes, there are some real good exceptions to this. What are those exceptions? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. <laughs> I remember uh, the Jesuit provincial Mark Hunter said, Oh, did I say that? Oh, excuse me, beg your pardon. <laughs> Then you're going to make a video defending them, right? <laughs> yeah. Can I prove that to you? No. No. But that's what I believe. But I remember that he made this comment. You did this thing. Let no one despise thy youth. Let no one despise thy youth. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 12 on to verse 16. Now, Paul said this to Timothy. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, self-sacrifice, 
in spirit and faith and purity. Now, it is greatly believed, and I believe it as well, that Timothy was in his mid-twenties. I believe personally that Timothy, when Paul addressed this unto him, uh, that the Holy Ghost addressed this unto him to Paul, excuse me, uh, that he was in his mid-twenties, like somewhere from 24 maybe to 26. That's what I personally believe. But I believe that Timothy was a young 20-something-ish. I, I believe that, okay? But look what Paul said. Let no man despise thy youth. He did say that to him. But be thou, but be thou an example of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Study to shoot thyself approved unto God, that thou be a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the line on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So yes, Paul said, let no man despise thy youth. Timothy was a youth. I believe in his mid-twenties. Yes. And I, I have prayed for a while that there be a young 20-something-ish out there who would be a Timothy for today. And I thought there were. Boy, I was wrong about that! <laughs> but now, why did Paul say this to Timothy? Why did Paul say this to Timothy? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3 now. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's establish some things. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, not greedy of money, but patient, not a brawler, nor not covetous. Not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? People will say, well, in order to be uh, one of these things, then you got to be married. It's like, okay, then you got to have kids. <laughs> Explain Paul then. He wasn't a bishop. <laughs> yeah, and you're not saved by works, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Pride. Likewise must the deacons be grave. Not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so, their wives must be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. What does this mean? Um, man, male. There's, uh, like I've said, I've seen on YouTube these uh, these female apostle, apostles and women preachers. And then, and then you try to, you, you, you know, you've, you mentioned this to them. Oh, um, 
ministers, ministry, as far as preaching, teaching, it's for men. It's supposed to be men only. That doesn't mean that a woman, a, a sister can assist like, you know, hey, you know, I got some ideas or, or you know, help find stuff in scriptures. You know, it's like, hey, can you, wh wh where's, you know, that kind of thing. But as far as actual preaching and teaching, ah, it's supposed to be men only. De 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 deal, deal with the scriptures. Okay. You as a sister, as a woman, there are ways you can help. But as far as actual preaching and teaching, it's for men only. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good decree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. There is no such thing as a female preacher, pastor. Scripture forbids it. God forbids it. Okay? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up, into glory. First Timothy 2, verses 9 on to verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. And I've addressed this before in another video. I'm not going to get into it. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. Wait, 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 wait. Am I... Oh, 1 Timothy 2. Excuse me. 1 <laughs> Timothy 2, verses 9 on to verse 15. Beg your pardon. 1 <laughs> Timothy 2, verses 9 on to verse 15. You're, you're like saying, Brad, what are you doing? Beg your pardon. 1 Timothy 2, verses 9 on to verse 15. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. These, these, these Christian women in the, uh, on these videos... Uh, my best friend, our brother Alexander, has a knack for finding these. <laughs> and he posts these scriptures um, about these so-called Christian women that are number one preaching book they're not supposed to do. Um, they're dressed like harlots. They're dressed like men. Look at Butch Joyce Myers. I arrest my case. Look at that whore um, Beth Moore and that uh, Paula White. They're Christians too, remember. <laughs> in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness. Godliness. Other than separation, okay? With good works. Good works. What are those good works? Helping, aiding, washing the feet of the saints, that kind of thing. Okay? Let the, women, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Yeah, you feminazis, you really don't like that. Especially knowing that woman means of man. Oh, I got, I've got my head bit off for that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But um, yeah, um, some of you women out there. Woman means of man. Man was made, uh, woman was made for man, not man for woman. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 on to verse 37. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I, that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And these people, these Christians, who are under their woman pastor, God help you. God help you. Verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay, now, again, why did he say this to him, though? Why did, why did Paul say to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth? Hmm? Why? Um, first, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10, on to verse 17. Okay? This is why Paul said to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth. This is why Timothy is the exception. And I pray God that there is an exception out there for this younger generation. I thought I saw a couple of them. I was wrong, wasn't I? Maybe in years, maybe. But now, <laughs> verses 10 unto the close of the chapter. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, self-sacrifice, patience, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers, seducers, could that mean women? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Right here. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who taught them? The Lord. And look at this right here. And that from a child bring up a child in the way he should go and when he is older he will not depart from it and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Look at verse 15. Why did Paul say to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth? Why? Because, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. So see, Timothy was brought up from a child, as a child, you know, a little regret, in the scriptures. He was brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, which should be done today, but isn't. No, they're handed off to televisions, to video games, to Jesuits, okay? But no. See, Timothy from child, a little regret, was brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 2, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, Verses 1 on to verse 7. Okay? 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son. Son. No, Timothy was not his actual biological son, but he called him his son. Why? Because Timothy was brought up under the tutelage of Paul. So, that wasn't that Catholic thing, you wicked Catholics, no. But, um, Paul became a father figure in the faith onto Timothy. We, we just saw about it, okay? We just read it, okay? To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Now remember, Timothy's father was a Greek, but his mother was a Jewess. So, you women out there of the Church of the Living God, see a way you can help. Grandmother and mother brought up Timothy in the scriptures. See, a sister in the Church of the Living God, of the Church of the Living God, doesn't mean that she can't be proficient in the scriptures, but see, with the scriptures, hand it off to people. Hand it off to, to men who will preach it or help uh, help some uh, a man, uh, your husband or whatever, with, uh, with, with that, okay? See, that's something that a sister can do, okay? As we see, Lois and Eunice, they, from a child, has known the Holy Scriptures. Who, from a child, brought up Timothy in the Scriptures? To women. Because his, his father was a Greek. You don't see him mentioning anything about his father who was a Greek. Do you? You sisters out there? Be in, wow. Be encouraged by that. Okay? Be encouraged by that. Okay? Wherefore I put thee to in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind, which these Christians don't have today, do they? Do they? I, I do, like I said, I, I, don't, I, I mean, maybe there is out there and I don't know. I, I'm sure there is. I hope there is of a youth out there of the Church of the Living God who is the exception as was Timothy. But, you know, nowadays with uh, God being removed from the family and the uh, families are, you know, so quick to hand them off to, you know, schools and here, watch TV, here, play a video game. These are the last days, brethren. These are the last days. And the Lord, and, and we as the Church of the Living God, we have all been called to service. We are ambassadors. We are ministers of reconciliation. Now, that does not mean that all of us are going to sit here and do this. It doesn't mean that all of us are going to sit and do this, that, or the other thing. We've already looked at it. There are certain other, there are certain things that God has assigned to those within the body. Not everybody's a preacher, a teacher, apostle, a prophet, whatever. Okay? There are different functions within that one body. Okay? But you have been called to do something. I mean, you look on YouTube, man. You know, <laughs> wow, wow. It's either easy believism, 
the love gospel or lordship salvation. True scriptural salvation, true scriptural faith. Where is it? It's not really on you. It's definitely not on YouTube. And those that were aren't doing it anymore. You know? And those that were at one time have gone on to be with the Lord. So, you know, today is that satanic Black Friday. Black Friday, meaning it, it has nothing to do with the ham, okay? With the Hamites. Um, there's a big business jargon. They were in the black, meaning they made a lot of money. They were in the red, meaning they didn't make a lot of money, okay? And I've made, I think, two, three videos about Black Friday. But see, <laughs> today Black Friday is a day of covetousness for the satanic, perverse, disgusting holiday that is on the horizon. And all those ships are in California still in docks, apparently. So, um, this is going to be it for this video. Um, like I said, uh, the Lord and I, the Lord kind of started this uh, last night. And um, this is what he, this is what he gave me to speak. So, um, it's going to be it for this video. I, I hope this encourages and maybe helps a couple, uh, some of you. Um, the Lord has all called us to be ambassadors. The Lord has, we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what you do in that ministry of reconciliation, okay, as a man, that's up to the Lord. As a woman, you know, again, that's up to the Lord. Know as a woman that the Lord is not going to call you to be a preacher. And if you believe that the Lord has called you to do so, you're not hearing from the Lord. Deal with the scriptures. You can argue prophetess all day, all night. That was a different dispensation. Different dispensation. The Holy Ghost was not a permanent resident at that time. Different dispensation. Okay? And prophetess, oh, like Jezebel, who taught the people to fornicate, Nicolaitism, you know, Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's going to be it for this video. Um, thank you so much, brethren. Thank you so much for all of you. Um, you know, when you take a day where you, you know, fast from from sun uh, sun up to sundown and give attention to the Lord, and uh, or at least fast for a, a twelve hour period or something like that, we could always be more thankful. We can only always be more grateful. I, I, I strongly say that we can't be thankful enough. Thank you. Thank you to you, our brothers, our sisters, for your prayers for us, for your mercy unto us. Without the Lord through you, I don't know where we'd be. Thank you. And we love you. And we pray for so many of you. And please, brethren, do pray for one another. Keep each other in prayer. Pray for, pray for our brethren in other nations. Pray for the sick. Pray for the babe. And may God bless you. And we love you. We will see you in the next video. Okay?